more than 60% of dog owners report that their dog is leash reactive. This is not only frustrating, exhausting, and embarrassing, but it can also be very dangerous. Well, the good news is there's a solution. In this video, I'm going to explain not only why your dog is probably being reactive, but the seven different factors that contribute to it and how to fix it. Let's get into it. Bonjour, you beautiful person. My name is Evan Doggett. Real last name. No, didn't change it to become a dog trainer. And for over a decade, I've been helping dog owners and dog trainers deal with leash reactivity and aggressive behaviors. Warning, if you are of the purely positive mindset, I might not be the trainer for you. Now, while I don't believe in just applying corrections, there are six other factors as part of this video, I will be talking about corrections. So if you think that saying no to your dog is cruel, you can just hop off now. And for everybody else, buckle up. This is going to be good. Some of these might surprise you. So first, let's define leash reactivity. What is it? Leash reactivity is when your dog is lunging, barking, generally freaking out on the leash. But there is no intent to hurt, to harm, to actually bite, make holes in another dog, person, cat, whatever it is that they're being reactive to. The majority of people with a leash reactive dog report that when their dog is off leash, there is no reactivity. A lot of them go to doggy daycare that, you know, they can go into a park as soon as they're off leash. They're they're fine. So why is that? It's my professional opinion that the majority of leash reactive dogs, it comes up from pent up energy and frustration. They want to get to and inspect or interact with the thing that be the, the thing that they're being reactive to. Now, some dogs start off as having a fear reaction. They see something, they freak out and then the thing goes away. They bark at the dog, they bark at the mailman, they bark at the car is a great example. The car's coming, they bark at it, and what does the car do? It keeps going, it leaves. So what did your dog learn? Freak out and the thing goes away. Or your dog has a reaction and they're allowed to get to the trigger. They're allowed to go say hi to the other dog. This is extremely common with dogs that go to doggy daycare. They bark, bark, bark on their way into the daycare. They're all excited and they get to go in and have eight hours of uninterrupted play. Or they're not reactive when they're going to daycare. They're excited. Everything's good and happy. They know it's a safe, fun place. But then when they see another dog out in the real world while they're on leash, they see another dog. They get excited. They're not allowed to go to the other dog and they freak out. But regardless of why your dog is freaking out, what started it, you might be reinforcing the behavior by petting your dog and trying to reassure them, doing a very human thing to reassure them and say, it's okay that you're, you know, that's a, that dog's not going to hurt you. That's a friendly dog. You might be reinforcing that behavior, but guaranteed what's happening in every dog's body, whether you're doing that or not is the dog is being reinforced by chemicals in its body. It's getting hit with a, a, the high load of adrenaline, dopamine, serotonin, cortisol. Those are very, very addictive drugs. People jump off of buildings and run through the streets of Spain letting a freaking many bulls chase them to feel those feelings, to win the race, to be better than, to, oh my God, it's gonna get me. That's a very addictive cocktail. And that's what every dog, when they react, gets hit with the majority at different levels of those drugs. So no wonder your dog went from being slightly reactive to extremely reactive and reacting to anything, reacting to leaves and, you know, uh, bags blowing in the wind. And it wasn't cars, it was just bikes. And now it's bikes and cars and kids and it's drug addiction. But again, good news, there is a solution. So to cover the seven different factors, let's use a case study of this dog named Bentley that I worked with a couple of years ago. Bentley is a three-year-old rescue dog from here in Nova Scotia, Canada. I'd say he's like a collie mix. And Bentley's owners reported him as loud, aggressive bark and lunges when he sees other dogs or animals. No issues when he passes by people or cars. Let's see what they mean. I would call that very reactive. Okay, so the first factor in dealing with a dog that's leash reactive or really any type of reactivity is food. So Bentley was eating strictly kibble and he was eating twice a day. Both of those things, what he was eating and how often he was eating are contributing factors in his reactivity. Now it doesn't matter how expensive or cheap your kibble is, it hits the body, gets processed in the body the same way. 
sugar spike. Now, I don't know about you, but when I eat sugar, when a kid eats sugar, when a dog eats sugar, you get jacked up. So the time of day that you're feeding your dog matters, how often you're feeding them, because most people feed their dog and then they go for a walk. So your dog, have you ever noticed this, that your dog wants to do zoomies 10, 15 minutes after you feed them? 6 to 7 p.m. is always the witching hour for your dog. You're trying to like you know, deal with the kids or watch TV or whatever. And the dog's just like Meh, going crazy. It's going through spikes of digestion and getting hits of sugar, getting all jacked up. The other problem with feeding twice a day is that statistically your adult dog won't live as long. Once they become an adult, for most dogs, that's a year and a half to two years. You want to wean them off to feeding them once a day. So you don't have to change your dog's diet to feeding them a completely raw diet, although that will help in my opinion and experience. But there are things that you can add to your dog's bowl, things that are inexpensive like fish oil, coconut oil, different fruits and vegetables that will help balance the sugars of the kibble. And then of course, feeding them after you exercise and if that exercise is rigorous like you're playing fetch with them giving them a break post exercise like 30 minutes and soaking the kibble with either water or even better something like bone broth giving them that 30 minute break after exercise so that way they don't bloat and then feeding them you'll see a change in your dog's reactivity at the end of the video, I'll link a book, a book review that I did on what types of foods and things that you can add to your bowl if you want to learn more about that. Hey, I just want to pause for a second to say if you're enjoying this video, if you're getting any value out of it, please hit that like button. And of course, consider subscribing to come back for more content like this. Factor number two, one of the biggest factors here is training tools. What are you using? Well, Bentley's owners had them on a harness. They had previously tried a flat collar, which actually was worse. And for those of you that do protection work, uh, you know, IPO or Schutzen or whatever, you'll know that in that world, we call these big flat collars agitation collars. They, they basically piss your dog off more and make them more reactive. So a lot of people go to a harness because, you know, it's a harness. It's nice. The dog can pull. But that often makes the dog much worse and it creates this perfect example for oppositional reflex. Oppositional reflex is just a fancy way of saying, I pull you, you pull me. I pull a little harder, I pull you, pull me a little harder. And if you've ever been to a bar or you know, you're 16 years old in Canada, we do things like bush parties. When you're 16, you get a couple of 40s and you go to the woods and you get plastered. And there's always two knuckleheads or maybe more than that, but there's two guys that that line up, right? They go face to face and it's they're talking and they're being all tough. And there's no actually like fist thrown until until one of their friends comes up and goes, come on, Tom, it's not worth it, and goes to pull Tom away. And that's when Tom goes, ah, and he throws a haymaker and misses and falls and breaks out his teeth and his parents have to pay for new braces. It's the same thing with dogs. If you have your dog on a harness, whether it's a front clip, no pull harness, or a back strap, X back, they pull and they get more reactive. The other problem with a harness is you can't control where they're looking. You can be dragging them back that way. You know, God forbid your dog's not stronger than you on the harness, which is often the case but you can't actually turn their head and get them to look the other way as you're trying to drag them away. So having the right tools is a huge part of having a reactive dog and working through it. Huge fan of slip leads. You can use them around the neck. You can put them into a figure eight around the dog's nose. Prong collars, which when used properly and conditioned properly, is basically like power steering. Your dog won't want to pull. But if not conditioned properly, and for some dogs, it does make it worse. It can make it worse. So it's about having an open mind to different tools. A star mark is a great alternative for some dogs, younger dogs and more sensitive dogs to a prong collar. And even for some dogs, a gentle leader is a great alternative to something like a flat collar, a martingale, or a harness. Three, is your dog spayed or neutered? So Bentley was neutered at a young age. The younger that are neutered, the correlation that I've seen is the more reactive they are. If a puppy is spayed or neutered, like and I, by puppy I mean under 16 weeks that some rescue dogs do, they're explosively reactive because they never went through puberty. Now, while you can't sew those huevos back on or, you know, <laughs> change your spayed dog, there are things that you can add to their supplements that will help balance their bodies out.
Now, we did a full video on this with a two additional products that you can add talking about adrenal fatigue and why that affects your reactive dog. I'll also link that at the end of the video. You will see a, a, just a calmer effect with this glandular support or the simplex M or F. Four, what's your level of obedience? So for Bentley, they had some of his obedience down, but for but what most people do is they teach all of their obedience inside the house no leash on the dog and obedience is very contextual for the dog they learn kind of through pictures what does mom or dad look like when they're asking me to do this thing you might have noticed you you can ask your dog to sit and they sit right in front of you they're not but if you ask them to sit when they're like 10 or 15 feet away they come to you and they sit down they learn in pictures you ask your dog to go to their bed and they do it but then you sit on the couch and ask them to go to bed and they jump up on you they don't know what it means so the answer to this is practice your obedience inside, teach it inside, practice it inside, and then practice it outside. Practice it on your walk. Don't make your walk just your walk. Practice your obedience. Come, sit, down, heel. That's all you need. And maybe a little look command as well is nice. So Bentley's owners had my online course, my seven elements course, which is all just food and leash training. It has nothing to do with e-collar training, but we did that as well. So they can practice in low level distraction and then we're going to introduce dogs. Five, what's the owner's experience level? Some people have a history of raising reactive dogs, of raising aggressive dogs. The last five dogs they had from different breeders, different genetics, different breed of dog, they've all been aggressive. That's a huge red flag for me. That wasn't the case with Bentley owners. They were actually brand new dog owners. They had never had dogs before. One grew up with dogs, but the husband only had cats. And so he had no idea what to expect. They were both watching different YouTube trainers. They were both consuming different content. One saying, you know, say no to the dog. And the other one saying, if you say no to your dog, you're going to ruin your relationship with them. And then that creates conflict between you and your partner and you don't know where to do. So you just do nothing. A huge part of how I help people is, uh, you know, helping them understand that your dog is a dog. I know that sounds ridiculous, but as humans, we treat our dogs, we train our dogs like we would train our kids until you understand dog psychology, until you understand how a dog operates and that their primary language is not verbal. It is body language. It is communicating through movement. And once people understand how, you know, what that is, the difference between the two and then how to do it, you see a huge change of the expectations and the overall relationship level because the communication is better. Number six, corrections. I believe that corrections are a hugely important part of life. Maybe it's because my dad was a Mountie, one of the national police, and my mom was a teacher. So no meant no. It meant don't ask again, Evan. And to be honest, without corrections, I'd probably be in jail or dead. I would say the majority of people are on board with correcting your dog, but you're either just not choosing the right type of correction, your timing might be off, or the motivation behind the correction. It might not be enough of a correction. If you were speeding and you got a $5 speeding ticket and you had some money in the bank, $5 speeding ticket wouldn't matter. You would just keep speeding. You wouldn't learn your lesson. But if you were broke, and $5 was all you had, that would be significant. If anything, I would say a $1 correction would be enough. So it's all relative to the dog. And there's a lot of different ways that you can correct them that are very effective. Some of the most effective corrections that I found with reactive dogs are the following. One, dogs that are that don't like water, dogs that walk around puddles or don't want to go out, they'll hold their bladder, they'll hold their pee for like 48 hours if it's raining. Those dogs, a fantastic correction is a spray bottle. Here's me correcting a dog named Puddles, ironically, with a spray bottle. And this is his arch nemesis dog walking by. Stopped immediately. Stopped immediately. Done. I mean, not totally done. There's a lot more work we have to do, which is number seven coming up. But this was very effective for him. A different type of correction is a pet corrector. This is Sonny the Golden Retriever with his neighbor, arch nemesis dog as well. And with a couple of corrections from the air can, he stops reacting. He's learning to avoid that behavior in order to avoid the correction because it's scary for him. And by doing the other six factors, they actually became best friends that play every day together. 
For some dogs, a leash correction, a leash pop is super effective, but not when it's attached to a harness, a flat collar, sometimes a Martindale collar, but I find you have to pull so hard, which is why I also don't use choke chains. I haven't used them in over a decade because you've got to yank. It's the old yank and crank method before that chain actually connects to makes connection with the dog. Very effective tool. And then finally, e-collars. Another fantastic tool when used properly, when conditioned properly. I'll put in the description my intro how to uh, efficiently introduce an e-collar, how to condition an e-collar properly. For some dogs, it's very surprising how little amount of e-collar pressure, even a vibration for an electronic training tool, can stop the dog from reacting in the future. And for all corrections, sometimes it makes it worse. Sometimes you're not using enough pressure. Sometimes you're using too much. You got to be open-minded to switch up and go, okay, that didn't work. What about this one? Okay, that didn't work. What about this one? Hey, that was the winner. Because not all dogs are the same. But every dog I've ever met has responded to corrections when we found the right type and the right amount of pressure. The last factor when it comes to corrections is your timing. So many, if not all of reactive dogs give a warning. You might be missing it. You might go, my dog goes from zero to a million instantly, but you missed all the buildup, all the very quiet, subtle buildup. You have two options the way I see it. You can correct your dog at that moment when, when the buildup is happening and you'll have to use less pressure. Say no before your correction. Say, I mean, you can say purple potatoes. I don't care what you say, but make it consistent of the word that means it's coming. The negative pressure is coming then apply the pressure. No, click of the button. No, leash pop. No, air can, spray bottle, whatever. But if you wait until your dog is reacting, your dog went from, you know, 10, 15 out of 100 when they were building to 100. Well, then you need to exceed 100. You need to exceed their level of reactivity in order to correct it efficiently where they go, whoa, I didn't like that. That wasn't fun. What happened there? Well, every time you blow up, I'm going to correct you. So ideally, if you can intervene beforehand, great. Timing matters. The seventh factor, and this really has to do with the rehabilitation process. Once your dog has learned to avoid corrections, then it's about socializing them. Are you socializing them at all? How often and with what kinds of dogs? I believe that the majority of reactive dogs are extremely social. They might not have social skills at this point, which is why this factor is so important because ultimately most of them just want to get to the dog. They just want to socialize. But if you just cut them loose and let them react and you know go and be crazy, it can actually turn into aggression. It can turn into fights because they're so jacked up. You let them go over because, oh, the dog trainer on YouTube just said that it's He's pent up and he's frustrated. I'm going to let go let him say hi. No, you didn't watch the end of the video. Keep watching. We got to chill them out. We got to calm them down before we give them access to socialization. This is where working with a professional balanced dog trainer, a dog walker, somebody that can give you access to calm, chill dogs that you can re-socialize with on a regular basis going on walks, not just standing face to face, going for walks together out in nature, ideally, so that way they calm down, they can be distracted by other things other than the dog. And then you can gradually expose them to more and more challenging triggers, more challenging dogs. Or if it's cars or bikes, they're driving faster, they're driving closer to your dog. Starting at a distance is fantastic. I'm all for avoiding certain situations, if not all situations at the beginning cross the street, avoid the dog that's coming right at you. It might be too much to ask your dog to do that right away, but also push it, you know, systematically set these scenarios up, systematically set up these scenarios. <laughs> and if you're, you've done a lot of this stuff and you're still struggling, I put a link in the description below to book a one-on-one -on -one behavior consult where you can send me footage of your dog reacting and we can talk through what you've tried what's working, what's not working. So that way you can make a plan, have progress, get your confidence back and fix your dog's reactivity. If you wanna learn more about feeding your dog better, here's a video on the book review I did for The Forever Dog Life. And if you wanna learn more about the three supplements that I talk about to deal with helping calm down your dog naturally, watch this video here. And as always, know what you're loved. Bye meow.